One of my good friends in, in Sydney, Harry Vitiliotis. Harry's not his first name, but no one can actually pronounce his first name. He's a great violin maker, an amazing violin maker. And when I went back to live in Australia again in 2002, and looked up Harry and we got together again and started, started sort of, you know, dreaming you know, ridiculous schemes. And um, the first one was to actually get a, like, a good bicycle uh, to power a violin. And his friend, and also my good friend now, <laughs> who's a dentist, is, is very, very good with this kind of stuff too, mechanically. So we got together and we made this instrument and we went to the um, Olympic Bicycle Stadium, the Velodrome, which is a typical white elephant. You know, after the Sydney Olympics, no one uses it hardly, it's just empty. The guy who manages it wasn't there, because he would have said no, I'm sure. But the guy running the bar just said, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, probably you can just do a few laps with that. Gorgeous sound, great acoustics in there. And this sort of, I thought, oh God, it would be so good to have like a whole like chamber orchestra of this stuff. And you know, then we got ideas for like, you know, wind pipes. <laughs> and it expanded. Literally the kitchen sink on the back of a bike. I had one of those push mowers, you know those little push mowers, if you're feeling energetic you can go and mow three square inches of lawn. We hooked that up, pulley system, towed the zither, which was quite a construction, and we towed it behind the bike. So that when you draw a circle in the sand and say, what are you doing? Well, basically we've got a, a bicycle powered orchestra. The Harry's double bass bike, uh, last week we put that together. By the pace at which you go, you can look for resonance and harmonics and retune it and take it out again and play it in a, in a different chord. I've always forget I've got no brakes on it. And the ping pong balls, I love that one, that's a, that's a beaut. <laughs> Well, my name's Rod Cooper. I'm a sculptor, I'm an instrument builder. I might have up to 100 individual sounds on an instrument. I've also got a background in furniture design and construction. Yeah, I've built six bikes for pursuit. The turntable was found in the bush on the way up here. When you shake your bum, it just goes and wheel, wheel, wheel. It's like a classic DJ scratch right across that vinyl. I'll be maintaining the bikes, making sure that nothing goes wrong. If something does go wrong, I can fix it quickly in the pit stop. Well, if something breaks, it's like, you know, even Eric Clapton has a string break occasionally. He gets around that, you know. I'm Garth Payne. I'm here to generate some real-time electronic music based on activities of one of the bikes. What I've built is this little GPS tracker, um, which is transmitting wirelessly back to the computer. And it's uh, sending us information about the latitude and longitude of the bike, the speed the bike's going at, to generate sound in real time.
John Rose, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And Robin Fox, thank you very much, finally, for being on the music show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. We're sitting here in carriage works with a lot of bicycles, some of which we've been riding, all of which make sounds that you wouldn't expect from a bicycle. Uh, not quite sure what the first question should be. I mean, the, the w word that plays on my lips is why. John, the question why, you'd have to ask why music. The, the, the main issue is trying to get sound that moves through space. Mostly when we listen to music, it comes from a fixed point. And this is the, the transmission of sound over huge areas, such as we're going to be using the foyer of the carriage works here. So that's the first point, was to get sound that was mobile. The bicycle project is, I think, the third thing we've done together. The first one was uh, kites. Um, we uh, we basically, the kites play the music. This was done in uh, the middle of uh, Western Australia. We also had a ball project. There was a huge ball, which is like 2.4 metres high. The speed of the ball, of travelling, the bounce, the movement, that also controls sound. So there's, there's various areas we're trying to um, examine. Can music exist in these places? The homemadeness of the music is a very important facet of it, and this goes back to Granger and possibly earlier, doesn't it? Oh, it does indeed, yeah. and uh, I think it's one of the most interesting things about uh, this country. Uh, I think Warren Burt once described it as a science fiction nation. You know, it's largely detached from the European and American traditions. There is a real focus on that uh, inventiveness, the sort of you work with whatever you have around you, and often there wasn't the sort of institutional structures that you may have had in other parts of the world. Don't forget the sport connection with Granger too. Mm. I mean, there's this wonderful image of him when he was touring South Africa that they, the, the concert party, Eva Crossley, I think it was, was sort of going by carriage from concert venue to concert venue, and Granger always insisted on running between towns. And apparently he was like late for one gig, and uh, the sort of the binoculars were like scanning the horizon. And then along comes Percy, running, you know, along in his shorts and t-shirt, accompanied by a hundred Zulu warriors, which I think is one of the got to be one of the great images in 20th century music. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a delight in the kind of Heath Robinson nature of some of these machines, as I was doing earlier, riding around on a bicycle with a turntable on the back with a Barry Manilow record. That's right, scratching Barry Manilow on a bicycle. I mean, that makes me smile anyway. <laughs> Often the, the, the taxi driver situation comes up where people ask you, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm a musician. What kind of music? And immediately they've got in their heads exactly what, what kinds are possible. And I, I've also given up trying to define it. I just say it's unpopular music. And that closes the conversation immediately because the, 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 the idea that there's such a thing as unpopular music is beyond most people's comprehension. But that's what we're talking about. Music doesn't necessarily rely on a, on a consensus of an audience exactly the same way as when you're riding out in that big hall out there. What your perception was was, it was completely different to what Penny's was. When you write about the history of music, the same thing applies. It's, it depends where you are and what you're hearing and from what position. If you're going to write a history of music, sort of a 20th century, it always starts with Debussy for some reason or other and always goes through this sort of set thing. And if you write the history of music, uh, and it's uh, going to be a book for art college students. You know, it starts with the futurists, you know, and, <laughs> and, it, and ends up with sort of Brian Eno or whatever. So it's kind of, they, all, they both have Cajun, though. That's the only sort of link that, that you can't get by, because he's got more books than anybody else, so you can't get past that. You know? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there should be courses where, you know, you don't actually allow the mention of John Cage, just so people can find something else. I'll just leave a silence every time his name comes yeah, up. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> blank. Almost 33 of blank.